what we want to be doing. We want to be celebrating Harris. And we hope this is going to be a, a yearly thing. We want to thank you all for coming out. And thank you guys for being here. I remember Harris with lots of laughter. And that's what we need to be doing. Okay. Before he made it, he was still a hometown hero just because he was really pursuing what he loved. And, you know, that's a, that's a tough lifestyle and a tough gig. And to really put all your eggs in that basket, I mean, you know, he went to the high school for the performing and visual arts here in Houston. Then he went to Emerson College. I mean, he was crafting himself. He was putting everything in this entertainment basket. And, I mean, he hit it, you know. He, all the work, all the effort, all the investment he put in, was going towards a successful career. And I think we were just seeing the beginning of what he could have been. Even though it's been uh, 15 years, 17 years since I taught Harris, he was a, a very memorable individual. He was a theater student here, and he was a class clown, but in a, a different way than you normally think of a class clown. Uh, he had a very wry view of the world. When he came along, um, he was already known as Little Whittles because he was Stephanie's younger brother. And I knew already that he was someone who wasn't going to have quite the same work ethic that Stephanie had. But the thing about Harris, it didn't, it didn't matter because he was so clever and had such deep insights into the things that he was clever about. Like even when he was in sober living or like his last rehab he went to, like he had finagled them to let him go right on Aziz's show. They never let anybody do that, but he somehow convinced the sobriety people that he could handle it. And that's, that's who he was. He could tell anybody to do anything and they would do it. It all happened so fast. That was, that was the problem is like, from the time he became addicted to the time he died was such a short amount of time. I knew that there was some drug use, um, but I never, I never knew it was like uh, becoming a depend dependent kind of drug use. I, I think I was kind of naive too. Like I, I was, I, I should have taken, I should have looked looked at it more. When I mean, when somebody's using a drug like oxycotton, then I, yeah, I should have been there to say, what the fuck are you doing? I don't know if there could have been anything we could have done to help him, but I sure do feel like there, there was. He just wasn't really communicating, and I figured that he was using again, but I didn't think he was using heroin. I thought he was just doing pills. He texted me and told me. He literally me. texted, I'm using heroin? He said, I started shooting heroin, I'm going to rehab in Oregon, don't tell mom. Which is what he always did, like our entire lives. My mom was reading the text over my shoulder because she was at my house. I kept a lot of secrets for him over the years. So I was glad that I didn't have to keep that one because that was not a good one. And I was so mad at, I, and I also had never been mad at him until the drugs. I was never mad at him. I was always like, he could get away with anything. I just like loved him so much. But once he started like using and then like lying and just being like a general fucker, I was just like, I, I just was just so angry at him. It was like the worst time. It's almost like that time was worse than Like, that time was horrible. It's like, it wasn't a surprise. Like, it's always a surprise. You don't think somebody's gonna call and deliver that kind of news to you. You know? I don't know. Who got the call? I did. I got a call from a detective. And they have a lot of compassion. So. I was like changing my baby's diaper. And then I got a call from an LA number and um, I hung it up. I was changing a diaper <laughs> and then they called again. And then I was like, I knew it. 
before I even answered the phone. 